Hello. So here we are, just days away from what everyone is saying is the most consequential election of our lifetimes. And you know what? I tend to agree with them. The candidates for president couldn't be more different, the country couldn't be more polarized, and the issues couldn't be more crucial. You know, sometimes I'd just like to fast forward and get the whole darn thing over with already, wouldn't you? I've had a lot of thoughts and feelings about the election swirling around in my head for the last quite a while. I started writing them down in order to help give me some perspective, but then I decided to take, take it a little further and make it into a video and share it publicly. Uh, I have one crucial overriding reason for wanting to do it that way, and I'll share that with you uh, closer to the end of the video. Fair warning. If you're a big Donald Trump fan, uh, you might want to hit the stop button and go watch playoff baseball or something because I'm going to be fairly critical of him during this message for reasons I hope to make clear. Uh, but first, uh, a little humor. Um, at his expense, of course. <laughs> so uh, this is one of my favorite Donald Trump jokes. It goes like this. A small plane carrying five passengers, but only four parachutes, starts running into trouble. The passengers are Anthony Fauci, the Pope, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, and Taylor Swift. Fauci grabs a parachute and says, I must be saved because I'm needed to help the U.S. in case of another pandemic. And he jumps out. The Pope grabs a parachute and says, I must survive because I'm needed to lead my millions of followers through these troubled times. And he straps on a parachute and jumps out. Trump says, I must be saved because I'm the smartest man in the world. And he straps himself in and jumps out. So then Hillary turns to uh, Taylor Swift and says, you'd better take the last parachute because you're still young and you have your whole life ahead of you. Relax, says Taylor. There are still two parachutes left. The smartest man in the world just grabbed my backpack and put it on. <laughs> I enjoy that one. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I've been following politics a long, long time. I've always been a political junk, junkie. But over all those years of watching politics and following it, I've never remember anything remotely like the situation that faces us today. Not even close. There was a time not long ago when politics was boring. <laughs> Do you remember those days? Back then, despite having profound differences of opinion, we could still see a fellow American in the eyes of our opponent. They weren't demons that had to be destroyed. We didn't doubt their basic decency. We didn't doubt their patriotism. Uh, they were our friends and our neighbors. Civility and compromise were not dirty words back then. It wasn't that long ago. There was, another, there was a time not long ago when we had trust in the institutions and structures of our government. You remember that? We never seriously questioned them. Structures and institutions that had been built and refined with great care over the nearly 250 years of our existence. We had no idea really, at least I didn't, how fragile that trust was. For me, it was just a core belief that, that government, despite the fact that it's ham-handed at times and inept at times, it generally, generally worked with honest intentions. And in those times when it didn't, there were enough checks and balances in our system to bring things back into balance. I never would have imagined that one day in our great American story, a single man on a single night in November of 2020 could come along and begin to destroy that faith for so many. For now, we behold an America where millions, millions of people no longer believe that elections can be trusted. Imagine that. The American electoral system has always been the envy of the world, imitated by all democracies, and until 2020, its legitimacy was never seriously questioned. All based on the say-so of one man. One man. One man with an overpowering but fragile and bruised ego. His loss had to be explained. It couldn't possibly have been his fault. It couldn't possibly have been that the voters rejected him. 
this man, interestingly, had no quarrel with how elections were run in the states that he had won, and who, despite having virtually unlimited resources at his disposal, has never been able to provide any proof for his claims. You know, in a way, Trump is basically claiming that Democrats have cracked the code and figured out how to rig national elections. Can you imagine what a monumental uh, notion that is? Trump foresees this massive cheating. He bellows about it at every single rally, complains about it at every turn, yet seems helpless to stop it. I don't know about you, but to me, that's evidence that the Democrats have outsparted him. So why reward him with another four years? Instead, let's give the power to those cagey, super smart Democrats who can successfully rig election after election without leaving a trace. <laughs> For many, faith in our court system has also been damaged, perhaps beyond repair. Judges, grand juries, prosecutors, they only have legitimacy if they rule in favor of our guy. For millions, Trump is considered the victim of political persecution. And yet, when asked, most of those same folks will admit that they never read the text of those damning indictments against Trump. They're right out there on the internet for everyone to read. They're not difficult to read. They're not written in a lot of legalese. They are very specific and very compelling. They can't just be explained away by saying fake news. Most of those same folks that won't read the indictments also admit that they've never watched a minute of the January 6th House Committee hearings that were held a year or two ago. Yet the large majority of folks who testified were Republicans, Republicans who worked closely with Trump. Why close your eyes and ears when inconvenient and uncomfortable truths are presented to you? Shouldn't we be secure enough in our own beliefs that we can examine contrary points of view? Isn't that, after all, how we arrive at truth? All because of one man, one weak, narcissistic man of deeply flawed character who gave new meaning to the term poor loser. There was a time not long ago when the character of our president was just as important as his policies. The person in the White House was our role model, the best among us, the one we wanted our children to emulate. We wanted a decent man or woman to represent us, to be our face to the world. We wanted to be proud of this person. But what happened? Character no longer seems to matter for so many. Our president can be a rogue, a cheat, a liar, a fool. But if he can deliver gas at 20 cents cheaper than his opponent, then he has our vote. Have we really arrived at a time when we are willing to sacrifice character and honor, the things our founding fathers held so dear, for the promise of cheaper groceries? Are we the, that, are we that self-absorbed and shallow? There was a time not long ago when truth was prized and facts mattered. Now, however, the most outlandish ideas are given equal weight to long-established truths. Maybe we have social media to thank for that. A lot of people think so. But it's difficult to see how we can take a common journey together when we're all looking at different maps. It's sometimes said that we live in a post-truth world. You know, we all watch the TV in horror that January day as a mob of supporters from a defeated president sacked our capital at his urging. We saw it with our own eyes. We heard it with our own ears. And in the days following, Democrats and Republicans alike spoke with a common voice in denouncing the violence and assigning blame where it belonged. But isn't it funny what happens to truths over time? Like a river slowly eroding rock, wave after wave of lies can erode our perception of truth, allowing us to eventually be able to call those insurrectionists hostages and great patriots, while in the same breath contradicting themselves by claiming that the violence was not the work of those hostages and great patriots at all, 
but rather of FBI plants and Antifa. Come on, my, my Republican friends, both cannot be true. Yet I believe that truth still matters, and I know most of you do too. Just because someone in authority proclaims the truth a thousand times, that, that doesn't make it true. If he shouts it from the mountaintop and it echoes through the valleys for miles and miles, it does not make it true. If someone asks you to believe him and take his truth on faith without a shred of evidence to support the claim, then you should be as wary as, uh, of this alleged truth as you would be a, a, a patent medicine salesman who appears at your door proclaiming that his little bottle of elixir will cure everything that ails you. For that is a story as old as time. We human beings want the easy answer, a cure in a bottle, even for complex problems. So in so doing, we become susceptible to any charlatan that comes along bag in hand, ready to cash in on our fears and weaknesses. It's, it's what demagogues do. And make no mistake, Donald John Trump is a demagogue. Democracies throughout history have had to deal with unscrupulous men who use their charisma and their oratory to whip up the crowd, appealing to their emotions rather than reason. Demagogues actually follow a similar playbook. Here's a sampling of some characteristics of demagogues from Wikipedia. I think you'll see uh, Donald Trump in virtually all of them. Demagogues tend to be hateful, angry, full of grievance, blaming their opponents and outsiders for all of their country's ills. They tend to be charismatic and skillful orators. They largely target the have-nots in society, those who feel left behind, that are resentful of the more fortunate. The demagogue parlays their disaffection into total allegiance to himself since he is the only one who can fix their problems. Minorities and foreigners are often demonized in the most vile of terms and become convenient scapegoats the demagogue can use to stoke fear and resentment in his followers. Five, demagogues have little regard for established norms and institutions and feel free to break them when it suits them. And lastly, while it's true that most politicians shade the truth at times, demagogues lie frequently, boldly, and relentlessly and without self-restraint. Comparing a demagogue's lying to that of an ordinary politician is like comparing apples to sledgehammers. There is no equivalence. America has always struggled to design and maintain a coherent, humane immigration policy. It's not a new problem. For America has always been a beacon in the darkness. People have always wanted to come here, attracted by the promise of a better life, the American dream. But the level of hatred and dehumanization by the ex-president towards these people is truly shocking and, in my view, very un-American. This hateful language, calling them animals and vermin, is coming from a man who was born to privilege, who has lived a life of extravagant luxury his entire life. He has never wanted for a single thing. He who has so much, demeaning those who have so little, should offend not just those of you who follow the teachings of Jesus, but anyone who prizes treating all with decency and humanity. We are truly at an inflection point in our history, a fork in the road of our nation's journey. I can't remember any election where the stakes were this high. The country is nearly divided in half, each believing that they are right. Both sides have dug in. A million words have been written about the election and a million more have been spoken. And yet soon, it will all be over. But the aftermath could prove difficult as well. If Trump loses, God help us. He's already shown how he handles defeat, and this is his last chance. He will subject the country to another round of desperate attempts to negate the election results and avoid accountability for his past behavior. 
His minions have already filed thousands of lawsuits challenging various voting laws across the entire country, ready to plunge, plunge the nation into confusion and chaos if Trump does not win. Political violence is not outside the realm of possibility. And if he does win, if Trump does win, God help us. He has such a dark vision of this nation. He describes America as a third world country, for God's sake. He has told us he will take revenge on his political enemies. He has promised to deport by the millions, get re uh, restraints placed on the media. And he now has a legion of folks waiting eagerly in the wings to help him, to implement their ultra-conservative view of America and impose it on the rest of us, if Trump should be reelected. It would reshape this nation in fundamental ways, beginning with substituting Trump's yes-men for existing career civil servants in the federal government, their way of neutralizing the so-called deep state that he refers to so often. It wouldn't happen overnight. It would be incremental, but it would happen. And over a period of time, uh, mark my words, years down the road, those who voted for him and supported him will look around to themselves and say, my God, what have we done? One of our founding fathers, Samuel Adams, said, if ever a time should come when vain and aspiring men shall possess the highest seats in government, our country will stand in need of its experienced patriots to prevent its ruin. I believe that Donald Trump is the vain and aspiring man Adams warned us about. He is the demagogue the founders so feared would one day show up and threaten the republic we all hold so dear. At the beginning of the video, I promised to tell you why I created it and made it public. So here goes. I firmly believe that there will be an accounting in the years, decades, and centuries ahead. An accounting of history. We live in historic times right now. Times that will be the subject of intense study and scrutiny by someone whose judgment matters greatly to me. And no, I'm not referring to God. I'm referring to my descendants, my great-grandchildren and their children and their children's children. Someday, they are all going to look back and wonder where we stood in all of this, in this time of great national peril, when the country was in danger of veering off the course it had set 250 years before. Was their ancestor one of Adams's patriots, who spoke in the public square about the danger? Or did he sit quietly in the sidelines and do nothing? I think about those things now. When you approach 70 years of age, you begin to take stock. You think harder about your legacy and the message you want to leave for posterity. I want them to know where I stood and why. So my dear friends, the place is here. The time is now. There are no do-overs. The stakes could not be higher. Donald Trump has remade the once honorable GOP in his own image. They do his bidding now. They seem helpless to do anything else but his bidding. They certainly are not doing yours. So vote blue up and down the ballot and encourage your friends and family to do the same. You may not find Kamala Harris to be your perfect candidate, but four more years of the chaos and erratic, dangerous leadership of Donald Trump is your alternative. I'll finish with a quote by Lincoln, a famous one from his Gettysburg Address with the immortal words, that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. All my life, when I heard those words, I thought, it couldn't happen here. It is locked in. It's part of who and what we are. Democracy will always be here. Now I'm not so sure. So it's up to you and I to make sure that it doesn't perish from the earth. It truly is in our hands. So, good night. It's nighttime when I'm doing this. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to vote. I'm sure you won't. And uh, we will get through this together one way or the other. God bless you all and take care.